Okay, welcome everyone once again to the Living Stronger Longer podcast. Today I'm very pleased to have once again Dr. Doug McGuff. Uh, Dr. McGuff, as most of you will know, is the co-author of the book Body by Science. Uh, Body by Science has been called by some uh, one of the best uh, books on exercise and fitness ever published. It's got a few years old now, but it stands the test of time really well. And Doug McGuff is also an emergency room physician in Seneca, South Carolina, and the owner of, um, hang on here, I want to say Ultimate Exercise. Yes, Ultimate Exercise is the name of the facility that he owns. And I believe he's also looking at expanding uh, into a second location. I think that's still a work in progress. Is that? That is. Yeah, it's a slow work in progress, but it's moving, inching forward bit by bit. Cool. So today I suggested to Doug that we might go through some discussions. Uh, you know, over the years, Doug and I have known each other now. It's kind of scary. You wrote an article about me uh, some time back when I had competed in, um, I think it was called Holiday Thanks. It wasn't just about me, but it was various things yeah. about things to be grateful for. And I was 50 and I'm 65. And uh, our paths along the exercise have kind of, followed similar things starting well Doug's younger than me we started around the same time I think but he was younger at the time and I was older and over the years interestingly uh, one of the things that you ponder about what's true what's not true things like that so I thought today what would be fun is to engage in some thought experiments on uh, maybe randomized controlled trials that we'd like to see that maybe are not even practical or ethical to do, but that would potentially answer some of the questions that we may have. So I, I thought, like, as I mentioned in the uh, literature I sent you, is people, when often people hear studies, they just lump it all together. And some studies are epidemiological studies, and some are random control trials. What's your understanding of, of those two and how they they are distinct from each other? Um, well, it, it's even more complicated than that. So randomized controlled trials um, are very difficult to perform um, because you have to determine ahead of time preemptively what the effect size that you're looking for, how big a difference between groups and then based on that effect size, you've got to pre-calculate the power of the study, meaning you've got to determine ahead of time the number of subjects that you're going to require in the controlled group that doesn't receive the, um, the intervention and the experimental group that does receive the intervention. You've got to determine the number to make certain that your study has the power um, to detect the effect size that you're trying to determine trying to detect in the study. Um, and then you have to have the self-discipline to apply the study as intended without adjusting variables along the way based on how it's going. And that's very difficult to do. The other thing is when you're looking at effect size, you've got to look at whether that effect size variable um, is even something that is impacted by the intervention that you're doing in the first place. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes the intervention has a very small effect on a very small effect size. And this, particularly when it comes to hypertrophy, is a very big problem in the research um, because as I've discussed previously, hypertrophy is a kind of an unwanted, tolerated negative side effect of adaptations to high intensity exertion. Um, so when you're looking at something that's already relatively limited and trying to determine whether one thing or another affects it um, in a more desirable way, um, that gets very, you're, you're thin slicing it so thin um, that the sandwich meat you can read newspaper print through. So that, there's that. Um, and then when you look at epidemiological studies, you're looking at entire populations. And that gets extremely difficult to do because the 
effect that you're looking for or trying to test for, um, when you get into really large populations, you get the numbers that you need to have statistical power, but then you incorporate all sorts of uncontrollable variables. Um, and that creates a signal to noise ratio problem. Um, and then, you know, there are many different types of trials. You know, there's cohort studies where you look at a group of people aged this to that, and then another cohort that's um, receiving a different intervention and compare how they do over time. Or sometimes you're just observing people exposed to different stimuli and following them over time to see how they differ. And those studies usually take very, very long periods of time. But whether you're doing a randomized control study or whether you're looking at a population study, the problem is always in the statistics. And this is certainly not my strong point at all. Um, I'm involved in um, teaching on the medical side in emergency medicine ultrasound and our fellows have to do a research project every year. And we have a statistician to help the, the fellows do their research and once she takes off explaining things, I'm just left in the dust. Right. Um, so the statistics are very difficult, but to put it in simplest terms, let's say that you're just doing a randomized controlled trial of strength training done over 12 weeks and you know, college age students, 19 to 26. Well, that's sort of like doing a study of the average income of a person in Starbucks. It all works pretty good until Elon Musk walks into Starbucks. Right. So a lot of times you really got to not look at the statistics as done by the researchers, but actually look at the raw data. And there are times where you need to be not looking at the mean response, but instead looking at the median response because somewhere buried in there is a curve blower. And that curve blower can mess everything up. So doing research to answer the questions that we want to answer is extremely difficult. Sometimes it's better to have a good understanding of basic science and a talent at empiricism and just looking at things. Um, you know, everyone's showing these little clips of Arthur um, on YouTube talking about different subjects and one of them talking about just the abject superiority of strength training for cardiovascular conditioning as compared to running or steady state exercise. And, you know, I remember Ellington Darden asking him to justify a statement like that during the West Point study. And in the bulletin, he says, Arthur just tapped himself on the chest and he says, self evident truth. You know, you observe it. Well, here we are 50 years later, and studies are coming out recently that uh, Luke. Carlson posted on his Instagram about a study showing that when you look at resistance exercise, aerobic exercise, or a combination of the two for cardiovascular rehab, that strength training alone does better improvements in cardiovascular conditioning than even a combination, which was always sort of the soft pedal. Well, yeah, if you do both, you'll get a synergistic effect. And it turns out that um, actually, strength training alone seemed to provide the better stimulus. And there's Arthur saying it, tapping himself on the chest 50 years ago. Research is tough. Well, a couple of things came to mind. Nicholas Nassim Taleb, am I getting that right? The author of mm -hmm. The Black Swan. In uh, one of his later books, uh, I think it was called Not Fragile or Un Unfragile, I think, talked about how many times empirical discoveries are made by, you know, tinkerers. I like to call them tinkerers. I think of Arthur Jones as a tinkerer, which are later confirmed by scientists. And then often scientists come back and say they came up with it in the first place. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting because uh, Arthur certainly seemed to be right about an awful lot of things way ahead of his time. Um, from just, you know, keen observations. And, you know, the statistical part, the thing that came to mind was an article I read lately by Gary Tobes or Tobbs, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, the author of Good Calories, Bad Calories. And he was referring to a study, an epidemiological study, 
where people who had used artificial sweeteners, apparently it indicated that they gained more weight. Well, he sort of broke it down and it was over, I forget now, I'm going to paraphrase, 20, 30 years that yes, people who had used it appeared to gain more weight, but the whole group appeared to have gained, I forget, something like 30 pounds. Everybody, right. like the average. Everyone was getting fatter. And the pe everybody was getting fatter. The people who used um, uh, the artificial sweeteners had gained like 33 instead of 30. And don't quote me on the numbers, you know what I mean? But it was just, yes, they gained more, but you know, is that how much is that over a period? And he said, right. well, when you hear studies like that, his message was, you should say, well, that's an interesting theory. It'd be interesting to have them actually test it, you know, because there's so many confounders that could come into play. Not right. the least of which is that people who use artificial sweeteners are like more likely to be people who struggle with their weight in the first place. Right. And, you know, that's the problem. In a scientific study, you have dependent and independent variables. And the assumption of the scientific method is that the independent variables can be held constant. Meaning everything except the thing that you're trying to test is held constant. And the problem is, is in the real world, those variables are never constant. Right. They're always changing. And they're always changing over time. So if you're doing a particularly a long-term study, that becomes more and more problematic. And whereas empiricism um, just takes into account the background noise of the fact that these variables are always changing. And um, it, it's not held to the same standard of holding these variables constant. So yeah. it's easier to be correct, you know? And, you know, that's why it's so much easier when you're dealing with people. Um, you know, if somebody is is uh, in engineering and they're trying to build bridges and they're trying to figure out the best metal alloy to make the strongest bridge and, and the lightest metal and, and durable and everything else, they can much more easily isolate everything to do their experiments. And of course, with people, there's ethical considerations, right? Because there's things you could do with people that, you know, would cause some of the people harm. And of course, you can't go down that path. I mean, unless you're, uh, you know, Nazis in World War II and, uh, you know, they did some horrible things. I've heard, I don't know if it's true, that some of the advances in the 20th century in medicine were, were due to the fact that they did things um, that were highly unethical, but allowed them to do experiments that nobody else would do. Right. Um, or even not necessarily highly unethical, but things that would never pass an institutional review board today. Um, you know, when Denton Cooley implanted the first artificial heart, it wasn't even approved yet. Um, it was not FDA approved, it was still in the prototyping phase, but he had a patient on the table that was either going to die or he could implant this. He had someone run down to the lab and take this thing out of the autoclave and just implant it. If you did that today, um, you know, you would lose your license. The hospital would lose its um, ability to bill Medicare. You know, it, the it, it would never happen today. So, um, you know, there are measures in place to make certain that people don't get exploited, but it's extremely difficult to do research because of the stringent criteria of the institutional review boards and um, CITI. Um, they all have very strict, even to the extent that, you know, when we're doing studies and we're seeking volunteers and the volunteers happen to be medical students, there are considerations for the fact that um, they are doing this because they're economically disadvantaged. Um, it's almost impossible to do any sort of research that involves prisoners um, right. because they're in a position where consent is influenced by their vulnerability. So yeah, it's really, really tough. So it sounds like an example of one would say where the road to hell is paved with good intentions, although somebody could argue how good the intentions are, but in many fields, regula regulatory bodies 
uh, hinder a lot of things, supposedly in the name of helping. So one of the things you and I uh, grew up, if you will, in uh, being influenced a lot by super slow methodology. And super slow methodology, of course, is the quintessential perfect form, really slow turnarounds, you know, minimizing force in every way, shape, or form. Uh, recently, I, I came across a YouTube video of a natural bodybuilder. I, his name is, I think, Kevin Richardson, memory fails. And the guy's a good guy. He, I, I like him. Uh, he, he's a hit guy, and he's, he's been natural all the way through. doesn't even use supplements. And uh, does, you know, really, he did, works out three times a week, really low volume. Does a couple, you know, not quite one set, but when I see videos of him doing his form by super slow standards, would be considered absolutely horrendous, right? And he even mentions super slow in one of his YouTube videos, but obviously he doesn't practice it on on one. But he claims, and I have no reason to not believe him, that because he's kept his volume down and his frequency down that he's trained now for decades and remained injury free. So my thought is how big, if you're, if are injuries caused by poor form or overuse? And I know it's, like I said, it's probably a combination of both. Uh, but if your form is reasonable, do you know what I mean? Still, so you'd get a fail from Ken Hutchins. Uh, yeah. But your volume and frequency is, you know, keep in mind things like uh, from Bill Desmond's book about overextending and things like that. But how much of a difference, or is it really a lot of times just overuse that causes injuries? And of course, that's one of the thought experiments, which, you know, you probably could never do. Because it's okay, we're going to get people to use poor form to see if they get hurt. Um you know, would be any and have to be over a long period of time, et cetera, et cetera. Any have you thought about that over the years as to whether Ken and others have erred, at least from the safety standpoint, too far over on the side of caution? Um, yeah, I thought about it a lot, and I think you're correct. The thing is, is that um the chronic wear and tear, um a lot of times does not manifest itself for decades. And you don't realize that until you get to be our age. So some of the listeners may know that I used to be um, a BMX racer. Um, and that's a pretty high impact sport, especially the nature of the sport at the time that I did it, you know, with lots of, you know, high speeds, fast jumps, hard landings, and, um, you know, a lot of people that raced in that era don't really manifest any problems in their low back or their joints or anything until they start to get their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, so the problem is that I think super slow form takes the safety issue to an extreme degree, um, particularly in response to concerns about acute injury. Um, there's significant overkill there. But done over time, I think also what they're trying to do is trying to avoid the chronic joint loading and um, the more chronic stack up over time injuries that then make an acute injury um, vulnerable to happen. Right. Um, so, it's complicated. Now, I remember back in 2000 and maybe around 2000, 2001, I broke my foot. So I broke the first metatarsal in my foot. And, um, you know, being a training addict that I am, I did not want to stop training my legs or doing leg press at all. So I had one of those air casts on and I started to experiment with the leg press. And I found that I could do super slow leg press with my normal weight without it causing the broken bone in my foot to hurt. 
So I took the opportunity to say, okay, let's pick up the cadence and find out at what cadence I first start to feel a twinge of pain in this healing fracture. Using it as the canary in the mine shaft for when does it become hard to eliminate excessive forces. And, you know, I tried to rep it. 10, 10, I tried one at, you know, 8, 8, tried one at 6, 6. And until I went below 4, 4, I was fine. When I tried 3, 3, it started to hurt. And it hurt mainly at the turnarounds. Um, and that's a pretty insignificant degree of force when you're using as your canary in the mine shaft a healing fracture on the plantar surface of your foot. Um, so even at a 3-3 three, three cadence, I felt a twinge of pain. That's probably the cadence at which you're starting to have um, some significant forces being transmitted to the joints, all assuming pretty decent biomechanics. Right. Um, so stated differently, most commercial gyms, you walk in there and watch what's going on. And from a super slow Ken Hutchins, Drew Bay kind of standpoint, you know, it is a shit show. Right. But these commercial gyms are not going out of business, getting sued with injuries. You watch people train in, the, in really not good fashion at all, and they're not getting hurt. So there is a good amount of um, a buffer zone for sustaining an acute injury in these circumstances. I, um, I, I would push back a little bit uh, in the sense that I don't think there's nearly as many injuries as one, you know, a super slow advocate would predict. But I also think that unfortunately, people have accepted the idea that getting hurt as athletes that they think of themselves is part and parcel so when they do strain their back doing a squat and stuff like that they don't they don't think of suing the gym they just go to the car right no i would agree with that and secondly is you know you watch a lot of this you know you watch bodybuilders on youtube and they're incessantly talking about you know i'm getting protein rich plasma injected in my shoulder and oh i had to go get my bicep tendon repaired and this stuff and just act like that's kind of part of it or things that they do to mitigate against joint pain or the ice water bath I'm taking three weeks out before the Olympia and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot of a chronic and acute on chronic injuries involved in that. And I think that's what super slow really aimed to avoid. And I think Ken applies super slow to a lot of people and clients that are quite fragile. Right, but I don't think I think two things are good about it. Not necessary um, to show the type of progress or the things that we're looking for, but two things are really good about it. Is number one is it directly gets at the stimulus, so there's no lost ground. You know, as far as inroad goes, you start up here and you trim down. You go through the sequential motor unit recruitment in an aggressive fashion. There's no break, there's no nothing. And you get there relatively directly. Um, I think it's a really hard hit to do it that way in terms of the amount of volume that's required. Um, I think a lot of people, when they feel like they don't get results with super slow, they are not understanding when you are not unloading at all and you're aggressively recruiting and fatiguing motor units, that um, that affects the entire targeted musculature involved in whatever movement you're doing in that style. Um, but you'll still find people that are doing that that incorporate a lot of redundancy um, that goes through those muscle groups, maybe through a slightly different angle or a different movement, but you're still, again, buying that real estate a second time. Right. And the impact that that has on recovery and being able to progress is significant. I think people underestimate that if you're gonna use this exercise form, the motor unit recruitment 
homogeneously throughout the targeted musculature is so significant that you really do have to constrain the volume. Right. And I think another thing is you've got to get technically adept enough with it so that you can use a heavy enough weight to fail within three to four repetitions. And most people, when they select a weight that's heavy enough to fail at super slow within four reps, tend to get panicky by rep three rather than holding the discipline because it's it's very difficult to do it that way when the weight's that heavy. So I think a lot of people try it and have a negative experience with it. Just give me one moment, okay? Yep. I have a very punctual client who's here half an hour early, but I've told him that he's going to, going to wait till 10 30. Yes, our type of training that tracks the anal retentive for sure. Um, so, you know, it's interesting on a bit of a tangent on what you were saying. I have a, a newer client. And she really seems to have a good understanding of what we do. I'm actually thinking of asking her, or I've already mentioned her, the idea that she might want to help me train other clients because she seems to really get it. And I thought I'd share something with you I thought you'd appreciate. When I explained about the idea of sequential recruitment of muscle fibers, she said, it's kind of like you're doing a roll call to each fiber, the different fibers with every rep, and they're all saying, here, here, here right. to get them and i thought that was just kind of a neat uh, you know showing her real understanding of of what i was trying to explain yeah and when people understand it they tend to get better results because they tend to focus on the primary objectives because they know what it is that they're they're going to uh one of the things the other thing i had in my is over the years and I think we probably both have done this. You know, we're waiting patiently for the next book by Ellington Darden or the next book that comes out. And, and I think in the fitness industry in general, many people are guilty of looking for, you know, the magic pill. You know, what's that next routine? What's the next thing that's going to happen? And after doing this now, because I hesitate to do the math here, I started working out in 1981, so... 40 plus years, it occurred to me, you know, recently that, that the quest for the optimal program uh, kind of is a, a bit of a fool's errand, if you will, in the sense that when I look at my clients here and I think, is, is what I'm doing with them optimal? Because different clients, some people uh may not be willing to work as hard as other clients or you know whatever or maybe their frequency and whatnot I, i've just come to the conclusion as long as you're making progress as long as you're moving in the right direction i'm almost and maybe i've got i don't know if this is wisdom or cynicism but i've kind of like as long as you're making progress and you're not hurting yourself who cares have you have you gone down that road in your thought process at all? Oh, yeah, um, particularly with clients because they don't care what we care about. We're obsessing over hypertrophy, and that's just something that taps out really early in the game, and it's something that our body is concerned with only in the realm of trying to limit it. Um, but in terms of training clients, yeah, don't worry about that at all. Um, because they're not worried about it. Um, and I'm not even worried necessarily about progress as it shows up on the chart with the weight progressing or anything like that. Um, I'm worried about them stimulating the musculature in a way that it's going to adapt. Now, if we have to increase the resistance in order to keep the time under load in a tolerable range, go ahead and do that. Yeah, fine. But, uh, um, you know, I care that they show up at a decent interval and put out decent effort. And it doesn't have to be epic effort. It doesn't even have to be the failure because when you consider the style of performance we're trying to enforce, 
that's creating that sequential motor unit recruitment and it's capping to a level that they would otherwise never reach right and they never have reached in their entire life previously and that's where all of the good adaptations come from it's going to give them functional capacity strength posture metabolic conditioning um, cognitive enhancement, improvement of the thickness of your skin, all of those things cascade down from that. And, you know, it it doesn't have to be what you and I are seeking. Right. But the fact that you and I seek these things makes us able to appreciate and try to develop those things. The, the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, you and I, I have both messed around with really trying to get optimal equipment and have trained on optimal equipment. We've been to the Renex conference and we've been on those machines. And what I found is the better the equipment and the better the form with it, there's a downside to that is now you are really operating on a razor's edge because right. those highest order motor units at the very end of sequential recruitment, they hide. They hide from the world as much as they can for as long as they can. But we're finding a way to turn that rock over on them relatively regularly. And they are not used to that. Um, and if you incorporate even a little too much volume with equipment that is that idealized, then you get into the realm of those higher order motor units having a real difficulty recovering. Right. So in my studio, we're we're mostly booked during the week. So if I have a workout that falls during the week, I generally can't train there. I got to go to a commercial gym that has pretty good equipment, but it's not, you know, MedX is not retrofitted, Ken Hutchins, Nautilus, super slow systems, anything like that. So, but, you know, half the time, sometimes a little less than half the time, I'm training down at my studio. And I'm constantly shocked at how much more aggressive that equipment is in terms of the workout experience and um, how little it takes to get really, really knackered. And I think it's just because, you know, if your strength curves aren't perfect and your form's not perfect, you're going to go through a sequential motor and you're going to recruit almost all your, but there are some really high, high order motor units that still get to hide a little bit. And sometimes I think there's a little bit of an advantage to um, those imperfections. Because if you're able to really tap those hard every time, it becomes more and more problematic to recover. And the amount of volume, um, the degree to which you've got to limit volume is very disproportionate. I think it's bigger than most people think. Yeah, well, and, and you know, interestingly, I had a few clients. I had a, a there's an, another trainer who moved from Toronto to uh, town a few, uh, about 20, 30 minutes from here. And I had a number of clients and some of them were like literally his father, his parents-in-law and whatnot. And, and they asked me, they said, you know, this guy's like down the street. He's just, you know, five minutes from us, we can walk. And I, I knew the guy, I mean, you know the guy too, Blair Wilson, you know of Blair. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I can't justify you driving here to tell him you that I'm gonna do better than Blair. Blair's a good guy, he's trained right, me. Yeah. He knows his stuff and everything else. So some of the feedback I got from some other people was that Blair uh, pushes them further and pushes them harder. They felt the workouts there were harder. Now, mind you, he's got MedX equipment compared to my old Nautilus equipment as well. And I thought, okay, well, that's food for thought. And actually, I'm scheduled to go train with Blair sometime. But then I thought a lot of these people are in their late 60s to, to, to mid 70s. And I have kind of debated whether, you know, fair enough, you know, that shows, you know, that he's able to motivate people and push them further and everything else. But I kind of debated to what extent that might make a difference and whether that difference might be positive or negative, especially with that, you know, demographic of people in that age group. And I, and I don't know the answer. 
Uh, again, I right. go to as long as they're making progress. But, you know, when you've got somebody who's doing that, and some of them are playing recreational hockey and things like that, I'm just thinking, do we want to push people that hard? You know, they have to be able to recover. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's for the individual studio and instructor to figure out, because if that starts to reap negative consequences, it becomes evident pretty quickly, um, both to the client and the instructor when you start running up against a brick wall. Um, and that's the tricky part about running a commercial studio. Um, and it's it's a difficulty I run into less with ultimate exercise because most of the clients just come once a week. So almost everyone has a pretty broad margin for recovery. But I have found that studios that are in larger metropolitan areas I think because they have a broader population to select from and they're able to select four people on the more entertaining side of the um, capability curve in terms of recovery intensity and things like that, that the studios in larger metropolitan areas tend to train with slightly higher volume they tend to train more frequently. They usually set as their standard at least two workouts per week. And they tend to really focus on delivering an experience that waxes the client. Right. Whereas studios that are in rural areas tend to use less volume, less frequency, and are less oriented toward waxing their clients. And I think it's simply because the population density is less. So you have less ability to sample from the right side of the recovery capacity curve. Right. Um, and I think that declares itself over time. I think if you were able to take your operation and plan it in the middle of Toronto or Minneapolis or Cleveland or, or a large population area like that, um, you're going to be sampling and you're going to have more clients stick around looking for that experience because they are on that side of the recovery curve. Um, but then what becomes problematic is that, you know, if your studio is built on an automated monthly withdrawal symptom for X number of workouts per month, and all of a sudden, someone's exceeding their recovery capability, you know, and objectively their frequency needs to decrease, that's difficult to adjust for within a given business model. Right. And, um, you know, that's when you got to run a business and be creative too and figure out how you're going to make that work. Right. But the bigger a population you're in, the more you're going to select from um, the right side of the recovery capacity and um, exertional tolerance, all those things you got a, you're more able to sample from a population over on this side of the bell curve and build your business 80 to 90 percent out of those type of people. Um, so the problem becomes how do you extrapolate that experience? when you get someone that's not on that side of the curve. Right, right, interesting. And it's interesting because Blair, of course, has a facility in Toronto, which he still has, and he's moved here into a much smaller community um, where he, you know, he is having a second one. So changing subjects, one of the things that I had mentioned to you about, and I recently read a book and it was called TRT. I'm going to forget the exact thing. I'll put it in the, in the notes. Um, the upcoming next, uh, you know, sort of pandemic of, of addiction, similar to, you know, what we've seen with uh, the painkillers and things like that. And this book talked about a number of kind of horror stories of people becoming addicted to these things, uh, men having affairs, uh, you know, all kinds of issues around that. And it does seem it, not so much in Canada, but in the States that it's becoming more and more readily available. And of course, in the last three or four years, 
my trust in the pharmaceutical industry is at an all time low. And, um, and it just seems to be, and, and of course, the potential to make money by pharmaceutical companies with an aging population, baby boomers. And there certainly seems to be some benefits. I've also listened to a podcast where one doctor suggested it was malpractice not to use TRT with certain people. There certainly obviously seems to be some very tangible benefits to TRT. Yeah. But I just wonder about the dark side and uh you know you know how it could go wrong for some people what are your you have thoughts you mentioned before it's a personal choice yeah it's complicated um because Rick, because it it depends upon the situation so in a lot of these trt clinics um the decision to give it may not necessarily be based on any given blood levels or pre-testosterone. Sometimes it can just be, you know, how are you feeling? How's your libido? How's your mood? How's your concentration? And if it falls below a certain level, it's like, well, yeah, we'll give you a TRT. And guess what? It gets better because we don't know what your optimal baseline was in youth. Right. Um, so there's... There's no real hard objective measure of when it's good to give it and when it's not good to give it. Regardless of that, when you give it, like any drug, you got to understand that there are therapeutic effects and there are side effects. And the side effect profile will always be proportionate to the therapeutic effect, i.e. the better the therapeutic effect, the more significant the side effects are going to be um, because any drug just has multiple effects in the body and if there is a a certain effect that we desire we call that the therapeutic effect and everything else we call the side effects and i've told this to you before originally they researched a drug for treating hypertension for lowering blood pressure and it had this side effect of giving you an erection and then someone said, oh, hell, instead of having a blood pressure drug with the side effect of giving you an erection, let's have a boner drug with the side effect of giving you hypotension. Depends on what your goal is as to what's a side effect and what is a therapeutic effect. So that's there. So when you give super physiologic amounts of testosterone in a dose-dependent fashion, you're also going to get some of the other effects. Um, if you don't control for aromatization, then you can convert some of that to estrogen and get the feminizing effect and may grow some kind of nasty or breast tissue. Um, you're going to have some upward trending of your blood pressure. You're going to have some stimulation of your bone marrow and an increased production of red blood cells. So you can become polycythemic. You can have thicker blood with higher blood pressure. You know, you're going to have more of a propensity for cardiovascular events in, in a relative term. Weighed against people that truly do have testosterone deficiency have multiple negative side effects from that that can be treated. So it's, it's not simple and it is a matter of choice. But a lot of times people are really wanting to take it because they just want to feel better, but more importantly, to look better or seek a certain body composition. Right. Um, I had a guy that worked with me that was a locums doc working with me that ran one of these um, functional medicine clinics, and he offered like, like, well, hey man, I might try that. My recovery feels like it's compromised. I'm getting older. Um, and they did my blood work, and my first testosterone was twelve fifty. God dang, that can't be right. And he goes, okay, we'll wait six weeks and it's probably just something off or whatever. We'll wait six weeks and we'll draw it again. And then they drew it again at 1,308. And he goes, well, no, no testosterone therapy for you. But I certainly don't feel like I have the manifestation of a testosterone that high. Now, when you look at my free testosterone in that blood work, it was on the high end of normal, the free testosterone. Why I have all this circulating, I don't know. Um, but part of my theory is that testosterone is um, 
a push and pull scenario. So you can push it with exogenous administration, but you can pull it by demands for testosterone receptors. I think high intensity strength training, good diet, low body fat, um, good sleep hygiene, and doing some stuff where you're in charge of things and you're making big decisions and you know responsibility rests on you. All of these go to the shooting range, you know, whatever, chop some wood, all those things also drive testosterone. Right. Um, endogenicity. So I think it's a two-sided coin. Um, but at the same time, when I look at some of the studies on um, TRT, um, I do think that regardless of one's testosterone level, administering exogenous testosterone seems to lift the lid on hypertrophy. Right. Um, because it is generating exogenously a level of protein synthesis that was otherwise not occurring. So I think almost regardless of your testosterone level, if you get exogenous testosterone, you're going to have more muscle growth because basically, as Skylar Tanner said, you're taking steroids. Right. Um, so I think something exogenous to whatever level you happen to settle out at as um, a homeostatic level when you administer something exogenous, you're going to lift the ceiling on hypertrophy that Mother Nature has placed on the given individual. So I think that always shows up. And when you look at the studies where they say, okay, we're going to train with weights, we're going to train with weights and take testosterone, and we're just going to take testosterone. Train with weights with nothing over the study period, they gain like five pounds of muscle. Weights plus testosterone, they're going to gain 15 to 18 pounds of muscle. Testosterone all by itself, you're going to gain eight pounds of muscle. So exogenous testosterone by itself gained a little bit more muscle than just strength training alone. So it, it does do that. There's no escaping that. Right. Um, and, you know, um, our expectations from training um, and our assessment of someone's expertise based on their physical appearance is massively distorted by the fact that most people in the realm where you're going to see them on YouTube or Instagram are enhanced. Oh, right. Enhanced. They're taking something that, and that, um, when you can get more muscle from just taking the drug than you can from any amount of training unenhanced why listen to advice from anyone in that realm at all well yeah that's exactly what i thought and it's unfortunate because some of those people do have good knowledge but to me earlier we talked about controlling for variable to me there's this gigantic variable sort of the the proverbial elephant in the room that makes everything else kind of like so far you know it's it, it, it's so far out in first place and second place doesn't even know it's it's there, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the the, uh, the thing, too, I think about addictive, being addictive, not in the sense maybe that heroin or cigarettes or alcohol can be addictive in terms of needing the substance, but, you know, once you've put on a little muscle... You don't want to lose it, yeah. You Here's the problem, lose it though, in your is... Own that just like there are variable levels of responders to the exercise stimulus, there are variable levels of responder to the exogenous androgen stimulus. So there are some people, when you give them TRT or you give them testosterone or steroids, they get a pretty large amount of the therapeutic effect that they're seeking with not huge amounts of the side effects that they don't want. There are people that when they attempt to do this, get very significant amounts of the negative side effects and very little of the sought after therapeutic effect. Right. And you don't know where you're gonna fall until you try it. But I would say that the people that are really good responders to exogenous steroids 
that have tolerable to minimal side effects are as rare as there are um, hyper responders to high intensity exercise. Right. And I think the people that are high intensity exercise responders are probably also the people that are very favorable responders to exogenous steroids. So we see on YouTube people that are already excellent responders that are also excellent responders to exogenous androgens. And they both of those things are a rarity. And just like we think we can take their training method and get their result, we think we can take their stack and get their result. Right. In fact, we may get all of the bad sides and none of the benefit that they get. And that's never really discussed. It's not just a given that you're going to take a steroid and just grow muscle and the side effects will be manageable or that you can monitor your bloods yeah. and make sure your blood work looks okay and you're going to be fine. It's like, dude, I see people have heart attacks every day with perfectly normal blood work. And perfectly normal cardiac stress tests done 24 hours prior. Right. I mean, I've seen that. I don't care what your blood work looks like. I mean, there are unmeasurable negative effects. Um, and just don't know where you're going to land with that. But sometimes, you know, if your testosterone is deficient and supplementing it's going to improve your quality of life, you know, that's good. I mean, it's hard being human. Because the way we're built, we are built with a lifespan that outstretches our reproductive capacity. And we get to live a long time, but um, we start decaying before we're dead. Right. And that sucks. There's not, I got to tell you, I mean, I'm 61 now. You're 65? I'm going to be 65 in a few days. You know, other than, you know, less stress, a little bit more financial independence, and some of the stressors that were there earlier in life being gone, and hopefully some wisdom. Other than those things, there's not one fucking good thing about aging. <laughs> there's just not. It sucks, you know? Um, and you, you fight it tooth and nail, but ultimately you lose, you know? The, the, um, worst, the worst part for me is all the other people who aren't coming along for the ride. The older you get, the more people you lose. Yeah, no, I mean, people just drop by the wayside, you know. Um, and, and that's tough, but um, but yeah, it's a complicated subject. It's interesting, you were talking about YouTube and online, things like that. You may remember the name Daniel Thompson from writing articles with... Uh, yeah, in the yeah I've seen him on Green Bay's site all the time. Yeah, and... Uh, and uh, he coined the term, uh, I was doing a podcast with him, he said, fitness porn. And I said, fitness porn, what do you mean by that? He says, it's all these, these influencers and whatnot on, on YouTube and whatnot. He says, it bears about as much resemblance to, you know, real life as, you know, when you're watching pornography, the people are, you know, everybody looks great and everything is, they're amazing, but it bears no resemblance to average people. But I know I'm, um, I could go on. I have a number of thoughts that are going on in my head, but unfortunately, we're we're running out of time. Yeah. So, any parting thoughts? Not really, other than for me and for you and guys like us and people interested in what we're interested in. I think it's just always a journey worth doing and worth refining. People have all sorts of hobbies and interests, and. Um, you know, I think there's just nothing bad about what we're doing and uh, that we should continue to pursue it and refine it. Um, you know, regardless of the degree of results that we produce relative to the other thing. And remember, hypertrophy, it's just, um, it, it's not what our body is interested in, even though we're passionate about it. Right. But there's still so much more to be gained from it. Refining the process so that you get better and not get hurt over time is really a powerful thing. Yeah. And we can share it with the world. Yeah. Just this morning, I had a client earlier and, you know, I said, uh, you know, this may sound silly, but the biggest difference between, you know, people split hairs so much about, you know, this is better than that or this and that. 
I says, remember, the biggest difference is whether you're doing it or not. I says, okay. even a substandard, mediocre strength training program, as long as you don't hurt yourself, is literally life changing. Yeah. Um, and, and because this lady, for, for uh, different reasons, has now chosen, she's only coming every two weeks. And today she was like, how come? How can this be? All my weights went up. I did better than the last workout. And I measured her on the body composition scale, her muscles up and everything else. How can that be every two weeks? I said, even doing it, I said, there are other benefits and other advantages to doing it more often, but temporarily, while you're doing it less frequently, you're not going to lose strength. And you're going to get incredible amount of benefits over and above not doing it at all. Yeah. So it is. It's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, you for the time you're a really busy guy. You're, I see you on other podcasts. You give up your time to do this and the word gets out. And, and uh, truly, as you've mentioned before, we're making a difference in people's lives and your contributions to that are greatly appreciated. I appreciate it. Go get your client. I'll go get mine. All right. All right. Bye for now.